Ladies and gentlemen, be prepared to take some epic notes because our next panel will be discussing how to scale your fintech startup. Leading that discussion is your moderator, Abby Sam Thomas, Editor-in-Chief of Entrepreneur Middle East. Um, once again, uh, everyone, just to introduce myself, um, my name is AB, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Entrepreneur Middle East. Uh, Tamara and I work together at the same magazine. Uh, first of all, again, as Tamara and everyone has been mentioning, thank you very much, Fintech AD, for inviting us and you know, uh, allowing us to be a part of this event. Um, I'm here to moderate this discussion on scaling up a startup, a scaling up a fintech startup, specifically with these three um, esteemed panelists. Um, just so that we you know, start things off, um, can I ask all of you to just quickly give me a quick introduction about yourselves and your company, and then we'll uh, take it from there. Okay, I'll go first. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Rowling. I'm here representing Yala Compare. Yala Compare is a financial comparison platform, and we compare and sell insurance products, and we compare banking products. Uh, hello, I'm Berin Musa. I'm the founder and CEO of Sukalmal, which is similar to Yala Compare. We are a compar financial services comparison site. Um, on the banking products where we compare credit cards, mortgages, personal loans. But in 2016, we actually added a new vertical, which was insurance. And in the insurance model, we not only compare the different products, but we also allow customers to go all the way through purchasing their insurance policies. Um, we started very much with motor insurance, and then we eventually added health, life, um, health home, travel, bike, and uh, yacht. So across the general insurance products. Yeah, hi, I'm Alex. Um, I started a company called Creditec, one of the first digital lending platforms uh, from, from Germany about seven years ago, um, focusing on um, lending to underbanked consumers around the world um, by means of uh, credit rating, which is done by using alternative data and AI. Um, we have um, expanded over the last seven years um, into 10 different markets uh, across four continents. Uh, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Western Europe, uh, Latin America, and uh, most recently uh, launched India. And uh, since, since last year, um, I'm no longer running the company as an executive. Uh, I thought after seven years, I mean, there was a good opportunity for me to exit. So I basically switched sides and then, I mean, more recently became an investor focusing on early stage investments uh, in fintech companies, particularly focusing on financial inclusion. I'm comparably new to the region. This is actually the first time I'm having the opportunity to get to know um, Mina to, to a closer extent. I'm very excited uh, to be here. Okay. So um, we now know who's on stage. I just want to make sure who we are talking to on the audience as well. Can I have a, just a show of hands, like who here are running fintech uh, startups, fintech enterprises? Okay. Um, investors from the fintech community? Anybody? Okay, so mostly fintech and entrepreneurs and startups, and um, I think we can, I can say it quite frankly. Like you know, it is one thing to set up a company that come with a you know a genuine set of challenges, but it's a whole different ball game when it comes to expanding a company and across, especially uh, this Middle East region, but across the world as well. Uh, Alexander, I, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, Credit Tech started out in Germany and it quickly expanded into uh, Eastern Europe, other European countries, even India, like you mentioned. Mm. How did that journey happen? I, I know it's like a really long mm. uh, number of years journey, but how did exactly that journey happen? What were some of those pitfalls? What are some of the hurdles mm. you faced? And yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Well, I mean, let me tell you, I think we probably learned a lot of things the hard way. Yeah. So, I mean, scaling a company, particularly as a first time founder, is not uh, an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. So. Um, in our case, we, we basically, um, I mean, very quickly sort of like noticed, I mean, that, that we have a good product market fit. Um, so so we, we, we realized our technology works well, um, which gave us the confidence uh, to, to basically expand and take it to other markets. We very quickly realized that we are solving is actually not, I mean, a country specific problem, but it's actually it's a global problem, um, basically creating uh, access to finance for, for underbanked consumers. Mm -hmm. So we basically started by actually being very analytical about which are actually markets that are, have the best fit for our product. Um, 
I know that most companies actually sort of like said, well, what are like the countries sort of like nearby? But I mean, we as a company based in Germany, we realized basically all the countries nearby are actually already very heavily banked, so not necessarily the best markets for us. So we basically built a framework. We looked into like all the countries in the world. We said, well, I mean, what is the percentage of underbanked consumers? What's the market size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to identify those markets which we actually think are the most relevant for us. And then when it came to basically, I mean, expanding basically across our domestic market, I mean, we initially thought we can do it sort of like completely centralized. So we said, well, I mean, let's have tech and product and, and, and I mean, the only thing we actually need in the market is basically sales. Um, but very quickly, we actually got proven wrong with that because we realized that, I mean, o I mean in order to be really su successful in, in each market, you actually need to have good presence on the ground. You need to have very deep understanding of the market. You actually need to be very, very well embedded into, into the local ecosystem. So throughout basically then a journey of several years, we actually went from like a very centralized organization to actually like, I mean, almost a completely decentralized organization. And then last year actually even shifted tech uh, and product development uh, on a local basis into most of the countries. And so basically by fine tuning this organizational approach, we effectively found a model which allowed us to operate all the markets at least sort of like with the same priority. Mm -hmm. Because that's actually one of the things that we also realized is um, with every new market that you open, you suddenly have, I mean, something else on your priority list you have to take care of. And that basically puts a burden on the organization. So you need to be very smart about how you basically structure your organization to be able to actually support all your markets in parallel. Mm -hmm. Right. Ambarine and John, both of you guys started out in Dubai. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of like proud to say that you guys managed to expand out of Dubai to many other cities, not just in the UAE, but also to Saudi Arabia and you know other nations like that. What were the main drivers for you for actually doing that? And when did you decide, okay, this is a good time to expand across, you know, out of my home base? Ambarina, I would like to start with you. Um, when is a good time is a, is a very interesting question <laughs> because uh, you, you know, the concept of an e-com business, if you want to call it, is very much you get the platform incredibly solid, you get your KPIs very strong, and once you've got the foundation solid, the idea is you start building up your top line, which eventually brings you to a path to profitability. Um, the decision of going regional, um, it's been always there. It's a matter of regulations. Mm -hmm. So the financial services industry is at least disrupted industry. Um, and until you don't get that license, I'm not selling shoes when I can say, oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to be doing this, but I'll rectify it. You're talking about financial services where um, for you to be able to launch a country in what we do is you need to connect to insurance companies and get their premium table. If you're going to do that, the insurance companies will not do it unless you are regulated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, then you take another step back and you go, well, what does it take to get regulated? It took us around a year in Bahrain. It took us around two and a half years in Saudi. Um, I am proud to say we're the first ever aggregator to have gone out of the UAE and been able to, yeah. to get a license. But that took a year of talking to the central bank, understanding their vision of things, but also supporting them in putting that change to get out new regulations mm. for companies that never existed before. Mm -hmm. And because we're the first one to have gone out, into the jurisdictions like Bahrain and now Jordan and Saudi, we needed to also be part of that education system and, and grow as much as the regulators were. So the question of when is when the countries are ready to say, yes, okay. welcome. But we've played, I think, a big role in, in having the ecosystem move forward quicker than, I guess, if we're not around. Um, and the reason you scale up is because any e-com business, unless you have scale, there's no, there's no path to profitability. So it's very much around from the start is build a foundation, build it strong, and then start thinking about what are the markets. But I have to say, I, I absolutely love what you said. Um, I think we're all obsessed with, it's a region, so we have to stick around the region. And recently I was talking to, um, to an investor from San Francisco, and I really loved what he said, which, which relates very much is, do we, do we build regional businesses or do we build businesses with a framework that no matter where in the world, the economics are right or the demographics, whatever makes that business profitable and work, then go to those countries. You right. don't have to always stick around you. Now, yes, though, having said that, the disadvantage of doing that is you need an actual proper regional presence yeah. or country presence. Whereas if you're running something out of here, it's an hour flight. It's so it's a little bit easier. 
Actually, I mean, when you're based in, um, in, in Europe, and I think the same is actually true for this region, you're actually well set up to, to run a business globally because of the time zone. Yeah. So in our case, there was actually one time a day where we could do an all-hands meeting with like all the um, <laughs> people from across the company uh, involved because of like time difference to, uh, to, to Mexico, time difference to India. So we had to do it basically at 3 uh, p.m. Central European time. That yeah. was the only time that worked for everyone. Right. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan, I want to bring you in. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I'm bringing and both of uh, Alex also mentioned this. Like talking about regulations, like this yeah. is such a uh, emerging market. Yeah. You know, most people don't know what's to be regulated, how to even you yeah. know consider regulations um, and things like that. But when it comes to startups, entrepreneurs, they're already ahead of the game. So how do you, uh, how did you know Yala compare navigate that particular landscape? Yeah, it's a very difficult landscape to navigate in a sense because in a lot of places there are no regulations. Yeah. And so if you're going to, you asked about whether the right time to start a business, if you waited for the regulations to be there, mm -hmm. you'd probably never start. So okay. if, if we think back to when we launched insurance in 2016, there's, there's, there's nothing in the insurance regulations that talks about online at all. And it's still not there, it's still coming. So you kind of have to do the best you can. We, we, we took legal advice. We were very clear that we're not doing anything that we cannot do. But by the same time, there's nothing that says you can do it either. So, so it's, it's really a minefield. I, I think, judging by the show of hands, I guess th there are a few fintech, fintech people here, and yeah. I guess the rest of you are in large institutions. The, the fintech people are always going to run first, because yeah. they have to. Yeah, yeah. If you think back to when we launched in 2016, we launched insurance. We were kind of launching something that the insurance industry probably by and large didn't want. We, we knew customers wanted it, we knew they were searching yeah. to buy insurance online, but there was actually nowhere for them to go. So, so at the very beginning, it, it's a kind of, you have to have a patient approach. You have to bring those insurance companies, banks, whatever you're doing with you. But at that time, you, you, you're, you've just got to be ready to be not a very loud voice, you know? And, and so you do that and you, you show the industry the traction and then, then they start coming to you. So it's, it, it's difficult. I, I, I want to kind of like build on that point, what you mentioned, you know, yes, regulations will take a time to catch up. Yeah. But you also mentioned you want to get the buy-in of, you know, people within the industry. And uh, yeah. that comes in back to like building those kind of partnerships yeah. uh, with, you know, leading entities within the region or within the country where you like, yeah. how, how has that model worked out for you? And I'll go into this for all of you, but yeah, John, I would like to just start with you. So, so two answers to partnerships. The, the, the first one is an industry answer. So what, what we always promised at the first, uh, in the beginning, and now we deliver on, is I've always said, I, I never just want to be your distributor. I, I don't want to be the guy that comes in and bangs the table, I sell a lot of product for you, so, so treat me nicely. Yeah. Yeah. What we always promise is that we will add value to you. And the way we add value to the insurance industry is we have a lot of data on pricing. So if you think about it, 25% of all the people that buy insurance on this, in this country, we've seen them, we know what that price is. We need to be responsible with that data in the sense I will never show insurer company B, insurer A's data, but you can talk in terms of market segments, averages, means, highs and lows, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then you're actually working with them instead of against them. And then the way that plays out is that they trust you more, maybe they give you more products, maybe they give you a better rate, but y you can't ever see yourself as working against them, it, it just won't work. What, is, what that partnership has led to is then other things. And we now get, initially at the start of our business, the audience was there, the industry is, is not ready. Mm. Where we get to now is that the audience isn't, isn't quite exhausted, but it's hard to find now. I mean, between us, everyone that's searching for insurance, they're going to yeah. see one or other us or both of us. What, what we've now started to do is look to to partner with bigger businesses that have bigger audiences that then we, we can bring those products to. So, for example, we've partnered with Dubai government through Smart Dubai. Mm -hmm. We have a partnership with the RTA in Dubai that we're about to announce. And, and the, the super cool one is we're going to be partnered with Etisalat. So next week we're going to be announcing that. So then there's a huge <laughs> audience that's, that's yeah. suddenly going to be it, we're able to talk to. Okay. Speaking about audiences, um, yeah. Alex, I want to go back to that. Like, w w when you launched Credit Tech, when you decided to go expand into serving, under, you know, underserved communities, was there ever a question of like, 
okay, is there a demand for this product that was this offering that I have? And if so, how did you manage that, like, you know, without actually venturing into the market, you know, full on? How was your strategy when you, like, decided to, you know, mm. kind of, like, parachute into these different, uh, yeah. <laughs> the different uh, countries or regions? Well, I mean, you obviously have to do your homework about, about a specific market, right? And, I mean, we started, obviously, with a bird's eye view by sort of, like, looking into specific macro factors. I mean, um, trying to get some data about, I mean, what, what is actually the market that's, that's interesting for us? I mean, what is, I mean, to which extent customers are banked? I mean, which, which are sort of, like, the, the criteria that banks look at when they, when they sort of, like, want to wanna lend to customers? So there's, I mean, there's a lot of data that actually helps you like identifying which are like actually the the most relevant geographies. Mm -hmm. But then you actually have to deep dive. You have to you have to go there. You have to you have to spend time. You have to basically meet potential partners. Um, we very usually very early in the process. I mean, always try to get someone who is very knowledgeable about the market on board. Um, um, to work with us of actually building up the the the, the, the local the local operation and. Um, at the beginning, uh, we didn't do that, and I think that always proved to be a mistake. <laughs> so definitely make sure. I mean, you can be as smart as you as you think you are about basically your business. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always I mean a very particular aspect about every market. So so we always made sure that we sort of like I mean I mean capture that, um, and then and then basically localize as, as as much as possible. So I think um, the 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 key reason I think why um, I mean and we launched ten markets in total, and we weren't successful in all of them. But the reason why we weren't successful is because there were actually local players in there who were only focused on one market, mm -hmm. and that was their key priority, and um, they were just better at executing, versus we had to deal with 10 markets, and then sort of like a particular, I mean, things like management attention and so on. I mean, the new market only gets a tenth of the attention, so you have to make sure as an organization you actually have the organization, you have the ability to execute, that you can be successful in all the markets. And uh, that's actually a lesson, really, which we learned the hard way. Um, think about how to organize yourself, how to structure yourself, that you can really, really be the number one in each of these markets and don't say, well, I mean, you're just one player. Because then otherwise, I mean, it, I would actually argue better don't open a market and, and I mean, focus on those where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambri, I want to go into that a little bit with you as well. In terms of not just execution, like, you know, executions, um, you know, scaling into new markets, how easy, difficult was it to get investors or the funds required to actually expand into these markets? Because that requires a significant um, financial aspect to it as well. How easy, difficult was it for you and Sukalmal? So the question is, how easy is it to find investors? Yes, <laughs> essentially, because <laughs> you need to expand. Question, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the investment landscape has changed a lot in the last 24 months. Um, I think there is more and more money being pushed into fintech, especially in the last 18 months. Having said that, I think the region is still struggling to attract um, funding. And I think the, the, the interesting I think, phenomena that's happening in, in, in the region from what I see is the typical bring your whole tech or bring your head office here and then I'll give you money. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there is that section that's going on. So there is funds available, but it's v attached to a lot of conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're, you're a new company from scratch and you've got two people, it's easy to move around and say, okay, well, you know, if, if the funding is gonna come from here and it makes sense for me to set up in this particular jurisdiction, it's an easy complaint. Mm -hmm. For companies like ours, I think you're at a scale now where you can't just move head offices and just plug and play. Mm -hmm. um, and people, talent, you can't just move them. They have families, they have schools, they have their houses. So it's harder for us to actually tap into this kind of fundraising. Um, what we have seen, however, from, from a VC point of view, I think there is a lot of fear around the region. Um, mm. But having said that, there is more and more funding coming from strategic groups. Right. So family offices, strategic groups, and what we've been attracting a lot in this round of funding, we're currently closing a strategic groups who have insurance interest mm -hmm. um, or banking interest. Yeah. So, and what I love about this is you start seeing the vision and visionaries in different major groups, but they have one or two people driving innovation, saying, you know, the digital train is going. It's either we get on it or we don't, well, and we if don't. we don't, we probably won't exist in the next 15 years. And the one concept I've started to see as well is, I would say around four or five years ago, if you were disrupting a certain traditional business, 
the first reaction will be don't invest in them because you're going to support them to disrupt mm -hmm. us. Nowadays, it's actually we want a piece of this because no matter what, with or without me, they will disrupt yeah. my business in the next five years. So let me j jump in this and, and be part of that. So has it been easy? Absolutely not. Fundraising is never easy. Um, but it's getting there, I think. I think, it, it, I guess the pot of money has changed and it's about where you're s s um, heading your business and how interesting or attractive you are to strategic investors versus VCs. Okay, but, um, um, we're kind of running out of time. I do want to open up the floor for questions. So if you have a question, just you know, uh, formulate it in your mind. We'll come with the mic. Someone will come with the mic to you. But I just kind of want to like touch upon that point which uh, Ambreen mentioned. I would like to get that buy-in from all of you, actually. Um, the idea that you know there are these conditions to mm. uh, getting funded, and like you rightly mentioned, it might not be possible for a startup of a certain scale of a certain growth. Um, given that we are here at FinTech 80, and given that we are talking this you know particular theme, what's the alternative? What is the better thing to do? What would be your suggestion to you know the the powers that be? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot, all three of you. I'm really sorry, but yeah. What did Go for John. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think um, <laughs> good question. Um, so, so, firstly, to agree that there, there are a lot of things out there. I honestly think it would be easier for us to raise money in the country that we were going into as a yep. startup yep. than it would be to raise money from here to, to go into that country. Yep. And I think a lot of why that's happening, it's, it's not really about the investment in fintech. You, you see companies trying to transform their economy mm -hmm. by, by bringing in these AI specialists, but th they want to have them in the country and kind of the in investment Build in fintech yeah. is somehow incidental to that. Maybe there's, there's a broader approach that can be taken and to say maybe, I don't know, maybe we can create hubs or have, but a lot of them really are, is you will have you know, we, we had one, you, you will have a hundred engineers in this country to get this investment. Mm. Now, basically we have a hundred people in total, there's no hundred engineers anywhere. So I think it's a matter of being a little bit more pragmatic, Re relaxing these very Losing strict rules conditions. Yeah. I mean, if you want to have a Yala Kampaya Sukomal in your country, it, it can be done, but it, then you might, you've got to be able to work with us in a way that we can actually do that and not switch off everyone here and suddenly put them there. It's just, it's just not yeah, viable. Yeah, be a bit more flexible on that, right? Yeah, Alex? Well, obviously, I mean, I can't really speak for this region, but I think, I mean, commonly it's like, I mean, you first need talent. I mean, yeah. talent usually builds great yeah. businesses and capital follows. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think that capital is the first thing that needs to be there. Okay. I mean, it's... it's yeah. So, it's, so but what I think they're doing, sorry, is that... You, you have to break that circle somewhere. So yeah. they want to put the, the capital is, is there now in country Y. Yeah. That'll yeah. attract the talent and then in time that'll reverse and it'll, it'll fall. Yeah. Maybe it should be the other way around. Look yeah. at the talent. Okay. Yeah. No, my point is different. I actually think you can almost, I think you can build a business almost anywhere in the world. I mm. mean, if, if your business is successful, you have talent, I mean, you will be successful in raising capital. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure about that. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, there's a given set of markets which, I mean, to some extent difficult for investors. I mean, we had the same issue when we, um, we, we had a very, su or we still have a very successful business in Russia, which we started 2013, 2014, basically the Krim crisis and all of this sort of like evolved. Um, and suddenly when we were speaking with US investors, we said, well, I mean, one of the markets we're interested in is, is Russia. Everyone got a bit reluctant and said, oh, okay, well, I mean, <laughs> that step away <laughs> might not be something we are like very keen on, 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 taking, on taking exposure in. On the other hand, I mean, um, I mean, there's always, I mean, also capital from a specific region and so on. So, so I think um, it's not like that capital is like, I mean, that there's a single opinion. I think if you speak with 10 people, you'll get 10 different opinions. And if at the core, I mean, your business is good, you have good governance. I mean, I actually think, yeah, you can almost build a business everywhere. Mm. Okay. I'm very so I will add one more component to what you both said. I think it's market size. Um, whenever you talk to investors, at the end of the day, it's all about how quickly can you scale, how big can you become. We don't have market size here. And I always think if every jurisdiction is going to tell you, come over here and then I'll give you funds, you kind of, it's a bit of a mm. chicken and egg. But there are a lot of symptoms we look at, which is lack of talent, lack of funding. 
but if you actually fix the core of the problem, which is market size, mm. but that means it goes all the way to the top and it goes all the way to opening corridors between the GCC countries. Those pathways. And it suddenly becomes one region. So I set up in the UAE automatically, I can have mm. an office open in Oman, in Kuwait, in Saudi. That will take time, but if it, that happens, you suddenly your symptoms that we're all talking about, lack of talent, lack of funding, will just disappear. Because mm. suddenly you've got a huge market you can tap into with one, through kind of one jurisdiction. The capital will come, and the capital will come in throughout the region, which in turn will attract talent, which in turn will attract more startups. Um, so I think, I, I know we talk a lot about the challenges of starting a business, and, and I think scaling up is probably the core issue. issue yeah. um, and that comes to every single country I go to. It's a whole new startup altogether. It's a new set of regulations, especially in the financial services industry. So can you imagine, you have to set up six startups as if one is not enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think you, you solve that market problem and a lot of the symptoms will solve itself. But again, it's a, it's a long-term it's, it's something, like I said, I hope the powers that be are listening, I hope they are looking at this as a, as a region-wide issue as opposed to like a country-specific thing. Okay, I promised questions, so if anybody has questions, oh, we have a question here. Can we get a mic to him, please? Uh, in the front there, yeah. If you can just introduce yourself and then go for your question. Yeah. <coughs> uh, my name is Mohammed Lemheri. Uh, me and my partners are part of an Emirati Saudi startup operating in the buy now pay later industry. Mm -hmm. uh, this question is for everyone. I just want to get your general thoughts about the buy now pay later industry specifically in this region, uh, in respective to insurance or uh, in the case of uh, Mr. Alexander, we inspire from startups such as you. Thank you. Okay. Do you want to take that? Uh -uh. A lot of interest in that space at the moment. I, I think you, you're definitely onto a winner there. I, I think there's a huge gap here in, you know, for example, in, in the UK where I'm from, nobody, 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 nobody would pay for their insurance 12 months in advance. It just has, doesn't happen. We would love to get to a place where we can sell that by installments. Just we don't know what that infrastructure is yet. So if you can solve that problem, I, I think you're on a winner. Another question, anybody? Oh yeah, here in the front again, please. Hi, so um, going to... Uh, Can you just introduce yourself? Sorry. Yes, my name is Khalid al Subai. I'm from uh, Al Amir Al Ola Investment Company. Okay. Um, uh, so I was just going to tackle a point. Uh, I think two of you mentioned Alexander okay. and Ambarin. So you mentioned that startups or fintechs should not wait for regulations in order to start their uh, journey or operations, etc. And that uh, also it takes time to tackle different markets mm -hmm. due to regulations. You mentioned two and a half years in Saudi, which is where I come from, and then a year and a half in Bahrain. So how can you start your startup without it being perfectly regulated and having the license I think uh, both you will have a risk operationally wise where you're not legislated to do your operations and at the same time your consumers do not uh, trust you because you're not authorized. Okay. So, so, so we took it the other way around. We, we didn't go into jurisdictions without regulation. So what we did was, and I think there is a, there's an aspect of you can go into a country and say, give me a license. Right. The, the insurance industry, you can't go in there without either being regulated or doing it in a certain way that is clean um, and compliant as such. What we've done is we've actually sat with the regulators mm -hmm. and I think it's not just about going give me a license, but about coming in and saying, listen, this is how it's done around the world. This is how we think it can be done here. So versus the asking, it's more what can you do to help the different central banks and different regulators around their jurisdiction to get to that point where they're comfortable enough. Because remember, you're also touching the core 
the core of a, any economy, which is the financial services. Um, and it's through this that we've managed to get our license in Bahrain, uh, and it's through this that we managed to get licenses in different different um, jurisdictions. John, yeah, okay. so yeah. just to clarify, what, what, what I meant when I said is don't wait for regulations. Well, what I mean is, if you're going to wait, for example, for online insurance to be regulated, it may never come, right? Because until there's online insurance, nobody's actually going to bother to regulate it. Yeah. So you have to be fully compliant with whatever framework is there now. But I'm just saying, don't wait until there's a very specific legislation for your industry, because by that time, somebody will already be, be doing it, and they'll be the ones that are regulated, and you'll always be catching up. Cool. Sorry? Ask for the regul. I mean, you can work with regulators and ask for them to to try and accommodate you, but but it's a long process. So I think nev never do anything illegal, never do anything non-compliant. No, it's not, but, it's not about doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously. <laughs> but yeah. in order to operate, there is no simple framework. So, like you yeah. said, you have to go there and mention what is the framework, how it could work, yeah. and it will be kind of tailored for you to operate in. Yeah. 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 Okay. It, it is kind of is like this something easy experience. or open to do or how, how can you go and ask Nothing for is ever for easy. A <laughs> uh, I, I mean I would love to say it's easy, yeah. here is an answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it's yeah. not you've got to be patient, you've got to persevere and I think that's a trick as well is you you know, you will get a hundred no's before you get a yes. And it's about how do you maneuver and who do you know, how do you get your networking as well across at people who can help you. And I think mm -hmm. uh, startups don't ask for help enough mm -hmm. and people are ready to help. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe the one piece of advice I would add, make sure you find the best advisors in every market who are actually very familiar with the local regulation. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in particular, if you're, if you're an outsider, I mean, you will, it will take you a lot of time to figure that out. So, I mean, speak with, I mean, find a good legal counsel, find, I mean, other startups, entrepreneurs you can basically connect with. And I think if you do that, I mean, you will very quickly get a feeling of, uh, the basic magnitude of the challenge. Mm. You'll be amazed how much time you save as well. Yeah. Just yeah. people who know it, where it might take you three months to figure it out. Yeah, just be brave to ask, I guess. Do we have any more questions? I saw one person that, yes, yeah, sorry. Last question, sorry, we are already out of time. Uh, to the gentleman, can you, yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Sunil. And I'm a founder of a startup. We're in the early stages yet. Uh, part of uh, uh, something linked to scaling up in a fintech is raising capital, because you need to raise capital to scale up your company. Mm -hmm. The question I have is uh, linked to raising significant capital to scale up is diluting equity as a co-founder uh, of a company. Uh, and sometimes you risk also going below the majority stakeholding uh, for the company, which could mean also your decisions being reversed at a, at a future point in time. When is it right for you uh, to give up that particular uh, majority stake uh, simply because you need the requisite capital to take it to the next level? Uh, will you be comfortable doing that? Uh, or will you take time? Or will you work, uh, uh, slow down the pace to ensure that you delay this particular point? Gonna, well, uh, yeah. I mean, I think that I mean, uh, really depends on your business, right? If you're in a, if you're, I mean, generally, I think I would say make sure. I mean, I mean, you have good economics, um, and actually, whatever money you invest, I mean, will actually generate a return for your business, right? Um, so the worst thing that you can do is like premature scale because that would just sort of like burn capital. Um, I think the the way, I mean, basically how fast you should basically go and how much basic capital to take. I think that depends a lot basically on your industry dynamic. If you're in a very competitive market, in a winner takes it all market, I mean, you might want to probably raise faster and grow faster because otherwise you would probably be crowded out at some point. If you're in a market which is less competitive, um, you can actually take your time and, and I mean, probably grow much more sort of like from your from your own revenues then I mean you might basically I mean want to want to prefer that generally I would say I mean I mean I would say um, it's generally always a good thing to take to take capital um, if you're in a competitive market so even if that means basically giving up certain rights as a, as a, as a, as a founder so I think there's a uh, saying, right? I mean, you can only be rich or can, you can be king. You can't be, you can't be both. In particular, if it's, um, 
if it's uh, your first time business, I would always recommend you basically take the money, make sure it's decent terms, uh, but I mean, uh, build a bigger pie than sort of like having, uh, having a smaller pie. Mm -hmm. At that note, I have to close. I've already been warned by the <laughs> people in charge. So thank you all for the questions. Um, we will be coming down here, and you can tackle them directly, yes? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Happy. Thank you. Thank you.